It's fear. You will yeah. be afraid. The fear factor all the time. Oh, shit. I, so, I got hit. And when they're thinking, they got hit again. This is what I teach people with panic attacks. What would you suggest to someone that is suffering from being anxious and fear, etc.? My idea with fear is that the bigger problem is people usually start martial arts or self-defense because they don't want the fear. Mm. They scare about the fear, they don't accept it. Mm. That's one of the main points. But my, my path is accepting the fear because it's part of life. Mm. And when you start accepting fear, the fear just flows. It's a normal thing and yeah. it's not blocking your life. Mm. It's not a problem anymore. This is what I teach people with panic attacks, to face them. Yeah. Because when they first, when someone has a panic attack for the first time, it's like they think they've had a heart attack. Because it's usually this, the racing heart. Yeah. And they don't know what it is. So they become fearful of it. Yeah. And that brings on the fear. They have a fear of the fear kind of thing. So what I say to people with, with I take them through the panic attack symptoms under hypnosis, relax them, and actually say, face your fear. Just bring it on. Just say, what's the worst you can do? Because the more you fear something, the more it becomes fearful. So this is what I say to people. You know, when people have a panic attack, it's normally about a minute of their lives. It seems like longer. But actually, realistically, it's only a minute. So you know the worst. So I teach them to go through, like, for example, racing heart. Under hypnosis, I bring, tell them to bring it up to a level that they, to show them they're in control, then bring it down. So they go, yeah, I, I can control it. So this is what you do when you have a panic attack. But we also deal with the anxiety and the fear. But um, I think I might have said this to you before, that there is a, a thin line sometimes between fear and adrenaline. Sometimes... I think I might have said this to you when I first meet somebody for the first time. I'm not fearful, but I am nervous. Mm. Even though I've been doing this for 18 years, I meet a new you. I didn't know who you were. I had the vision of who you were when we spoke in Italy. I didn't know who was coming, you know? Yeah. So I was nervous because I wanted to do my best for you. That's my adrenaline. Yes. Because every person that I see, I want them to be successful. Yeah? So that's my adrenaline. That's my fear factor. So I've done that for the first time, and I've met the person. I understand how I can tailor the sessions to that person. Um, the problem is when you're scared about the the fear, Yeah, you create a loop. Because you're scared of the fear, and you're like, oh, oh, oh my God, what's going on? Yeah, I'm in fear. I can't react. So you, the fear goes high and high and high and high. And then you're stuck in the fear. Yeah. And that's the problem. When you're stuck, you're not flowing. Mm. Mm. Why... Action beat the fear, because when you start the action, you start doing things, and, and that's the, the, the main thing. Mm. You want to break the stillness. Yeah, yeah. And movie makes everything f flowing Yeah, and gives you the energy. But when I changed my job, yeah. I was really scared. Yeah, because my I was taking quite a lot of money with my previous yeah, club. Course, and yeah, yeah. I called my Zanella, my mentor coach, and he said, you know, we can do a work to drop the level, but fear is fuel for your subconscious. Mm. Why do you want to drop it? Let's level it up and making energy for you to win. So he has this mindset, which is very similar to what you're doing, mm. actually. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. But what he did, what your author did, was he went back and faced something that he made into a big deal. That, yeah. made, that, that made sense. That, and that, you know, with regression, that's the same sort of thing. Sometimes it's going back, as I explained to you with the inner child, the inner child is troubled by something. I did this when I was uh, 16. I used to go to school up here. Did I tell you the story about the teacher? No. Oh. We had a, a teacher called Mrs. Roberts. And at the age of 11, I was scared of her. You know, she seemed huge, you know. Mm. And uh, I don't know why, when I was 16, because I was in the air, I went back to the school. And actually, school wasn't as big as I remember, because I could touch the ceiling now. I'm 16. I'm almost mm. an adult. Mm. That's mm. weird. And I went into Mrs. Roberts' class. This woman was four foot ten, and a really lovely woman. But she came from a generation of teachers that were quite strict. But I actually, when I saw her, I thought, wow, I thought she was six foot tall. But then again, I was 11. So the last time I saw her, I was small, smaller than her. But, but in my mind, I built up a dragon. But actually, no, she was a good teacher. 
And actually, she helped me a lot because she gave me the fight not to be a dunce, as it were, not to be stupid, because she saw in me something that I didn't see in myself. But it was at five years later I came back to that realisation that actually that, that wasn't a dragon, that was someone that helped me. So it's about minimalising the effect sometimes of, you know, what's gone on before, yeah. you know, that, if that makes sense, yeah? Yes, yes, yes. So that, that's, um, that's kind of what regression is about, about going back into something and finding that actually it's not, not that big a deal for, for an adult, that what's going on there. So, yeah, so that's what your author did. He went back and, and then, you know, ha happy ending, as it were, was that the guy got karma, didn't he, in the end? So, yeah. Yeah. We've got some other stories about people really in fear. What, how do they solve the problem? How do they come back to life? I told you about the guy that was a table tennis championship and he started to fail. Because he had the yips, which meant he, he like golfing as well. It's a golfing term called the yips. That if you concentrate too much on something, it becomes a problem. Yeah. And whereas he'd been quite natural, there'd been something going on in his life that had caused him anxiety. And the subconscious was showing him that there was a problem because it, it looked at what he really enjoyed doing and took it from him. But it mm. made him concentrate too much on what had been a natural thing, like driving. You and I drive. We've probably been driving since we were 16, 17, whatever. It's natural, you get in a car, boom. But the other day, for some reason, I thought about the process of driving. It was like I became really clumsy yes. because I focused too much on it. And this is what happened with the golfer, what happened with the table tennis champion guy, was that he was concentrating, was too aware of what he was doing. Mm. Um, he, instead of letting the subconscious do what was natural for him, he let his conscious mind question it. You can't do it because it slowed you down. Yeah, it slowed him down completely. So we yeah. got him back on track with that. Exactly. You focus. You have to focus on the mm. solution. You have to be proactive, mm. not reactive. Yeah. On one hand. And the other hand is you can't think of what you're doing. You can't worry. You have to stop talking. Mm. Mm. That's one of the main problems. Even inspiring. People start talking. They got, they got hit the first time and they, they start thinking, oh, shit, I got hit. And when they're thinking... They got hit again mm. because they're not focusing mm. anymore on a fight. Mm. They're talking to themselves, so they yeah. slow them. They, they slow them down. Mm. Because he also he, he was <clears throat> in his sixties, so he'd reached the peak with the the ping pong mm -hmm. and the table tennis, and he came to the realization that he was that his background had been that his father made him a winner all the time. That he did things he you know forced him into to being something that, he, you know, his father was always like, you must do better, you must do better. So in his ear was his father saying, mm. you must do better, you should stop failing like this. But he'd been a very sick, he'd been a champion for many years. But it, then what we did was in the end, he just said, well, I'm getting older, so I am getting a bit slower, so therefore I accept what's going on rather than fight it. And that acceptance helped him get back into the game again, accepting that, yeah. But there's a thing called catastrophizing, which is what I'm dealing with a lot at the moment. People thinking the worst case, you know, mm. um, what you know, what if I walk out here and I get run over by a bus or something, you know? Yeah. It's not likely to happen. This is what some people do when they're fearful, when they worry a lot. Yes. They think about ridiculous things, kind of, you know, like reading the end of a book. You know, you don't read the book, you read the last page. You know, the hero or the heroine dies, but you don't mm. know why or how they've died, because you're not with the rest of the book. But with catastrophizers, they just think the worst case all the time. How long do you live? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because you go straight to the end. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Because you're not, you're not, you know, yeah, the guy could have been 100, mm. or, the, or the woman could have been 100, but, well, they, yeah, they died. Yeah, well, fine, but we don't know how, because we don't read the rest of the book, and that's like life, isn't it? You know, you can't second guess what's going on. And one of the great things about life is that it's always different. Just when it, it comes that you think you don't know what's going to happen, something lovely happens, you know, when you least expect it. Yeah. You know, this is how it is. But people that catastrophize always think the worst, the worst all the time, you know. And that's more and more what I'm dealing with with people because they are being fearful all the time. We talked about this before with the government. It's fear. You will yeah. be afraid. The fear factor all the time. They're negatively hypnotizing everybody at the moment. So this is why people are coming more to me for anxiety and catastrophizing because that's what they're being fed all the time. It's just 
this all the time. So I would imagine that when you were at school, you you were you a daydreamer? Did you daydream a lot? Yeah, me too. This is very interesting because everybody that talks to me about what's going on in the world at the moment um, and etc. They're all daydreamers. My wife is a daydreamer. I was a daydreamer. Mm. Uh, my buddy was a daydreamer. So we didn't accept the indoctrination of what was going on at the time when we were at school because the school does do that. It gives you a, a certain way of thinking. This is right. This is right. That kind of thing. Whereas the likes of us didn't. So therefore we think more. We can see more. We analyze more, don't we? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Never thought about that. Never, you never thought about that? No. no. So, yeah. So, yeah, it was a good thing that we daydream. Based on your experience, what would you suggest to someone that is suffering from being anxious and fear, etc.? What would I suggest, apart from hypnotherapy? Or... Yes, of course. I, anxiety would be, um, for example, I would say to them, get some exercise, indulge in things that you like to do. Mm. so that you're diverting yourself from that to take yourself away mm. from what you're thinking about all the time. Obviously, yeah. the hypnotherapy will help you with that. Yeah. But also, Definitely. you know, if, if you notice on the first session we did, I gave you some homework, as I called it, to help yes. you these sort of things, that kind of thing. So I would suggest that to people as well. Just look at, try and analyze, try and th you know, if you've, if you've been born anxious, then you have a problem, but it's a learned experience as well. Yes. It's fear is a learned experience. Again, you know, um, when we're children, we're a blank canvas. So we learn things. We learn how to be fearful. We learn how to lack confidence. Yes. We learn pain. And it becomes, you know, as we get older. So it's to unlearn that. It's to go back and just look at the things that you really like doing, the things that you enjoy. Because in our society, we're taught to, you must keep working. You must keep working to pay the bills. At that point, we don't actually step out and say, but what do I enjoy doing? Mm. anymore so i would say suggest that to people with fear and anxiety is first of all face the fear look at look at why you're fearful what's going on in your life what what is making you fearful is it you know what's going on as we talked about with the you know with the government and that kind of thing is that making you fearful or are you fearful of something else you know look at why you're fearful why have you got that fear of the dark where does that go back to mm. and face that fear you know and the same with anxiety. Obviously, diet is important as well. When people are de uh, depressed, if they're eating rubbish, then that makes a person stodgy. But it is comfort. Or, or drinking. You're drinking. drinking but that's is comfort, terrible, isn't it? Yeah. But, you know, um, and in a way, it's like a child sucking their thumb. It's like people that smoke. Um, some people smoke with anxiety. And it's it's that. It's the thumb sucking. You know, put a cigarette in your mouth. Mm -hmm. That's, oh, I feel so much better. The same with, with food. You know, if you're feeling not good, that food, you know, is generally tends to be stodgy food. It's all chopped up. Well, that melts in my mouth. That's fantastic. Or, you know, this, this pie is wonderful. It's stodge. But then again, that makes the mind stodgy as well. So I would say look at what you're eating um, and look at your surroundings and, and work on those sort of things as well. Yeah.